Good. Well, thank you for those of you who are coming. I think a lot of people are dismantling tents and so on this afternoon, so uh, probably less people available, um, or just that it's a less popular subject or a less popular speaker. <laughs> who, 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 knows, who knows which it is? <laughs> um, so, uh, we're talking about advance in deliverance uh, this afternoon. Now, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to belt through some notes pretty fast. You will see them come up on the screens. Uh, if you decide that you want to write everything down, uh, you're welcome to, of course. But it will keep you writing furiously, because uh, there's a, quite a lot of material in the notes. I am willing for you to have the PowerPoint later, if you would like that. And if you think you would like that, all you need to do at the end of the session is to write your email address on this pad paper here, uh, and we will get you the PowerPoint in due course. Uh, I think, I just didn't know how many people were going to be here. I didn't want to cut down too many trees to sort of produce too many notes and so on. So that's the way we're doing it. So let's start with two or three scriptures. We're going to go start with lots of, you know, have lots of scriptures, obviously, but let's start with two or three scriptures. Luke chapter 10. Let's begin there. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Luke chapter 10 records the story of how Jesus sent out the 72 disciples. Luke chapter 9, he sends out the 12 on a healing and deliverance ministry trip. And Luke chapter 10, he sends out 72. One of the interesting things about that story for me is we don't really know where those 72 came from, how Jesus was training them at the same time as the 12. Uh, if you have any answers for that, it will be interesting to hear them. But clearly he wasn't just envisioning 12 apostles to go out, but many, many more uh, to go out and engage in his supernatural ministry. They come back really excited. And Luke chapter 10 verse 17 says this, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Well, that actually is quite exciting. And I want to just encourage you and give you confidence that a ministry of deliverance, of seeing people set free from powers of darkness in their own lives is a ministry of the body of Christ today and is open to those who wish to exercise it. It's not something to be frightened about. It's actually not something to be uh, too hyped up about either, as Jesus says. He replied, now I love this answer that Jesus gives them. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, when people get delivered from demonic powers that bind them, Satan, Satan's rule and dominion is starting to be eroded. And one of the great things about pastoral work is to see strongholds of the enemy eroded in people's lives, broken in people's lives, and people begin to thrive and flourish as Christians as they walk with Jesus. So he, so he says, yeah, this is great. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So sometimes we can get overexcited about the wrong things. And Jesus is simply saying, you know, be excited, of course, be excited about the right things that you belong to Jesus. Uh, but don't get overexcited about this deliverance thing because it's just part of our ministry in this world in which we live. Uh, and one more scripture, and these are two sort of fundamental scriptures right at the beginning, is 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Can anybody tell me what that says? I thought I'd try a bit of audience participation, but perhaps we won't bother. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says... 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So if we are about the ministry of Jesus in this world, we are seeing Christians built up in their walk with God, but we're also seeing Satan's power destroyed and cast down. So th this is part of the everyday life for those of us who are Christians. And, and on the one hand, what I'm going to try and be saying in the next sort of three quarters of an hour now, because we want some time for questions, comments, even maybe a few prayers of deliverance, uh, that would be good, wouldn't it? Um, so I'm going to try not to talk too long, which is why I'm going to belt through these notes as fast as possible. But one of the things I'm really trying to say is, look, we don't need to get overexcited about this ministry of deliverance. It's one tool amongst many in our pastoral toolbox to see people set free. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we do need to see the power of deliverance in people's lives. When I did theology at university at the age of uh, 22 to 24, it was in a liberal theology school in Oxford University, and many people did not believe in a personal devil in any sense, or that there was any such thing as a sort of demonic action in people's lives. This was just something that they used to believe in the old days. When you get into pastoral work, what happens is you discover there are things that you can't actually fix simply through encouragement, you know, a little bit of gentle prayer here and there, counseling, even counseling, and lots of people swear by counseling, uh, you know, there are certain things that you can't fix by those things, and all of those things are useful tools. Um, and you have to say, is there something deeper here that we're up against uh, that needs the power of Jesus to fix in the sense of breaking the power of the evil one in people's lives? So, uh, and what we're trying to say is, yes, that's absolutely the way it is. We don't want to get overexcited by it. It's one tool. On the other hand, it's an essential tool. And that's where... After years of sort of pastoral ministry, I think many of us have got to. And by the way, I may be the mouthpiece today, but there's lots of people sitting here in the room who have uh, as much experience as I do uh, in this. So, first of all, just to say deliverance is, uh, is it's our commission. Um, I'm trying to establish some biblical basis. You may you maybe get this and you've got it, but deliverance... Uh, is our commission without any doubt. Uh, it was Christ's ministry, Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, it was Christ's ministry, uh, but it's ours as well. Uh, he starts off his ministry in Luke chapter 4 by quoting Isaiah 61. It's about setting free the captives. Uh, that's what his ministry is about. That's the foundation for his ministry. It's also the foundation for ours. By the way, I noticed an odd blip as I read my notes through just earlier today that I quote here, Mark 2, verse 38 and 39, you will find they don't exist. <laughs> and so there's my first uh, mistake. Uh, and I can't think what I was thinking about when I put that text down. I mean, some of you may understand that, but so just, uh, just forget that one. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus commissions the 12 disciples to do exactly the same, to go out, heal the sick, cast out demons, etc. That's the disciples' commission. If we're disciples of Jesus, we will be heading in the same direction. That's our commission. In Luke chapter 10, as I've just said, because I read a couple of verses from there, Jesus commissions the 72 uh, with the same commission. It is again about healing the sick, casting out demons. In Mark chapter 16, at the end of his ministry, Jesus commissions the 11, uh, because obviously Judas has dropped out of the band, uh, but the other 11 are still commissioned to go out and see uh, people healed and people set free. Uh, so it's a clear commission for us, uh, or for disciples, should I say, therefore not one that we can just push aside and say, well, we don't need that anymore. Um, moving on, it's clear that Jesus practiced uh, setting people free from demons 
uh, very, very actively himself, and I put several texts down here again. They'll be in your notes if you want to get them, and I'm not going to read every verse, but I'm just trying to say there are plenty of examples. Perhaps Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 28 would be the one I'd like to read from there. Um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, no, that's not it either, is it? What did I say? Matthew 8. That'll be why I don't find it. Funny that, if you look in the wrong place, isn't it? When evening came, this is Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed the sick. We'll talk about that in a moment, but deliverance does not have to be a long, drawn-out and complicated affair or a big battle scene. Um, the, the trouble is, as soon as I say something like that, I think of various stories and illustrations. The things that takes time when I start preaching is the stories. And so I'm going to resist telling too many stories because we're going to have a few more stories later. But they don't have to be long battles. All I want to say is here's several times in which we see Jesus uh, exercising a ministry of deliverance. And one thing I would like to say, and I'm going to say one or two uh, slightly controversial things as we go through, but Jesus did not manage demons. He confronted them. And I think one of the things that God would ask us to do as we're thinking about this area is to understand there are some dividing lines that are sort of a little bit tricky. I mean, there are, so depression, for instance, let's talk about, now we all understand that depression is a mental uh, illness that afflicts people when the chemicals of their body get out of balance. And so we understand that quite often, quite often, the depression has to be dealt with chemically by medication to lift people up out of the imbalance that they have got into, their bodies have got into chemically. But at the root of depression, there can be other issues, emotional uh, responses going on, which may need us to dig deeper. And I suppose over the years, you know, I've had to visit people in mental hospitals who are getting treatment for one thing or another, sort of, you know, various mental, you know, types of mental ill health. And you sit in a mental hospital or psychiatric unit and you're thinking, this is tragic. This is absolutely tragic. Because, because what we're doing is managing illness, but somehow, and the doctors will say this to you, I mean, and I've had plenty of conversations with psychiatric uh, doctors and so on. Doctors will say themselves that they know that they're only managing illness. And that they're looking for deeper solutions all the time to how they can help people out of those issues. Um, I'm trying to tread very carefully here because what one doesn't want to be is insensitive to real medical conditions uh, which do need medication to help people up out of them. But if all we're doing is managing strongholds in people's lives but not actually helping them to break them we're only helping them a bit 
ultimately you cannot manage demonic oppression or affliction or things that are rooted in strongholds in our lives. Now that's not to say that we don't need the benefit of medication from time to time, because we do. Uh, because things need kick-starting to, you know, to put physical disorders right and so on. And it's not to say that counselling won't help, because counselling does help. It's understanding what's going on, at the end of Acts chapter 28 it says, with understanding comes healing. And understanding sometimes gives us keys to our own healing and, f and freedom and understand what's going on in us and why we behave as we and to go through prayer counseling processes can do us good so so i'm not trying to sort of dismiss every other tool that needs to be put in place as well but i am trying to say that there are some things you will not be able to we will not be able to fix without some direct intervention of god setting people free from demonic okay uh let me try and move on then so i'm saying that this is De jesus's ministry jesus did not manage the demonic was the point i was making and that led to a long story sorry uh, but he didn't manage the demonic he confronted it and there are times when we need to know how to confront the demonic in the early church um they practice deliverance. Here's, you know, some texts in the Acts of the Apostles. Since we're doing the Acts of the Apostles this weekend, here's a few stories about demon deliverance from demons and so on. Let me move on to my next point, which is to talk a bit about this word demonization or, or demon possession, which you will read in your Bible. But let me just try and say to you very, very simply, demon possession is not actually a biblical word and it's not a very good translation of what the greek says the greek talks about being demonized or demonization that's the literal translation in other words that somehow a demon has got some hold what is a demon a demon is a a spiritual power of darkness has somehow got hold in somebody's life uh, and, and has a power that it's not easy for that person to break. Now, expressions that come in Scripture, as well as being demonized, are having a spirit. For example, it talks about having a dumb spirit or a spirit of infirmity. Somebody is there with a spirit of uncleanness, with an unclean spirit. Somebody is troubled or afflicted by a spirit. Uh, or, actually... The scripture even talks about people being filled with Satan. That's Ananias and Sapphira. So, so there are a whole range of words, but, but not many of them really talk about somebody who is so loaded with demons, you know, that they are totally out of control. It's not that most of the time. It might be that occasionally, but it's not that most of the time. So the question is, and here's a sort of theological, one of those theological sort of conundrums, is can Christians be demonized? If you've got the Spirit of God within you, can you be demonized? Now, I want to stand back from that specific question for a moment and just point out some things that are said in the New Testament about the power of evil. First of all, uh, there are many warnings that are addressed to Christians about the attack of the enemy and our vulnerability. Otherwise, those warnings wouldn't be there in the New Testament. For instance, 1 Peter chapter 5, Satan is wandering around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. So he wants to devour. Satan is a deceiver, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, so he wants to get a deception into us. Galatians chapter 3 talks about Satan bewitching us. And actually, interestingly enough, that's, that bewitching is backsliding from walking by the Holy Spirit. Or Christians can go back into weak and miserable spiritual powers. That's clearly said in the New Testament. Or Christians can even be the mouthpiece for Satan. Keep going. Shall I keep going on what the New Testament says? Just to sort of say, this is what we are told in the New Testament. Christians can be taken captive by Satan and oppose anointed leadership. There's one for you. 
Just thought I'd, you know, for the sake of completeness, put that one in. Christians can enter into relationships that defile them, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Unforgiveness can lead to demonic bondage, Matthew chapter 18. Anger can give Satan a foothold, Ephesians chapter 4. And demonic wisdom can flow into our lives through sin. In other words, if we enter into sinful practices, that can sometimes get us thinking demonically instead of under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm saying that just to say we're given enough warnings, Christians are given, given enough warnings in the New Testament, that should tell us that Christians can come under the influence of demons. And many theologians said, well, surely Christians can't have demons because they got the Holy Spirit, but that's not what the New Testament says. We are vulnerable, and we have to walk in the safety, security, and protection of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, a spirit of infirmity can cause illness. By the way, the Scripture does use... Uh, what is called the language of strongholds. This is a picture from the Old Testament whereby every city was built with walls around it for the protection of that city. And then in the middle of the city somewhere there would be a stronger and higher part that was built up, which was called the stronghold. Uh, so if the city, wider city, were invaded <laughs> by the enemy in some battle or other, you could flee to the stronghold where you could be safe and protected. Now, what the scripture talks about is that sometimes there are strongholds in our thinking in the way that we think so that you know on a good day we might say no I know I need to do this but actually really what we really think is I'm no good nobody loves me uh, you know if I do this get into that I'll be exposed etc etc I mean all sorts of different emotional reactions it's called the language of strongholds I want to suggest to you that that there are times when we find that, if you like, most of the ground in our lives has been taken and possessed by the Holy Spirit, but there are certain strongholds of the way that we think that are still a challenge to us. And, th I mean, that's why these demonic things can be quite tricky to deal with, because it's to do often with us believing a lie. Now, there's a lady called Marie here. Where are you, Marie? I can't see you. There she is. Okay, hello. I'm not, not going to have you give your testimony because I know it's, it's quite difficult for you. Marie is French, but she's part of the... So we always talk a good bit in French together, which is very, very nice. She's part of the Swindon Fellowship, but uh, how long ago was it? A couple of years ago? One year. One year ago, uh, Marie had a very, very profound deliverance. Uh, and actually, we were going to tell her story. Neil was going to tell it, but Neil unfortunately double booked himself for this session and so he's not here to tell to tell the story but he tells me that what was really going on was that Marie had believed a lie about herself who she was actually that she was nothing useless etc etc uh, and that this had plagued her for years and years and years through her life even as a married woman uh, this had uh, you know had been troublesome to her and to her husband. She has a massive deliverance session, uh, longer than most of us would like, uh, longer than she liked for sure. But when she arrived home, her husband's testimony was she was a different woman. Well, if, and he's a non-Christian, by the way. So a non-Christian recognizes that his own wife has been set free of stuff that she's thought for years because this was a stronghold of her mind. So how do we recognize demonic activity? How, how do we say, well, how, how do we know that there's something demonic here? 
Let me suggest to you certain things. Um, outside of human beings, the spontaneous moving of things around a house uh, would indicate some demonic activity. Oppressions that are connected with places or certain activities may well indicate demonic activity. People's minds being filled with foul language is one way in which some people experience demonic activity. Excessive emotional holds or reactions. I'm thinking especially of things like rejection. Rejection is a very, very strong lie of the enemy that is deep-rooted in a good many people from an early age by having experienced rejection in families, feeling they don't count, they have no value, nobody loves them. People who have experienced divorce often find they're deep-rooted. I mean, they've lived with parents who've been divorced, often find there's deep-rooted feelings of rejection uh, in them, which they can't control. It's just been life has done this to them, relationships have done this to them, um, but it becomes a pattern of thinking. Along with rejection would be self-rejection. Uh, you know, I'm no good at this, I've never been any good at that, writing ourselves off, that is very, very strong indeed in quite a lot of people. And once you become a Christian, <laughs> it doesn't change everything miraculous. You may, you may find out, you know, biblically that you're a child of God and still be filled with feelings of rejection. This is part of the spiritual battle inside. And this is where demonic holds can can you know be part of things fear of rejection uh, is another big one it's sort of an insecurity thing in many of us uh, you know that well what if they don't like us what if they think I'm stupid what if they think I'm silly and it will stop us to do doing all sorts of things these things become paralyzing holds so excessive emotional holds or reactions and some people sort of run their lives on the basis of these feelings and holds in their lives it's uh, it's tragic actually addictions uh you know can be rooted in the demonic just being stuck spiritually feeling like not making any progress i can't make it any progress i'm not getting where i'm anywhere in my spiritual life well, there's lots of things that you try first, like, are you reading your Bible, and are you praying, and are you in fellowship, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's some basic questions that we ask first, but if this becomes an absolutely paralyzing issue, then we've got to say, so are we looking for something deeper? Um, consistent habits of insecurity or control, irrational fears, premonition of evil. Where is Gail? Gail, come and give us your quick testimony, please. Uh, Simon will give you a microphone as you come up. You need to run up here because you're on film. Yeah, please run. <laughs> I'm running, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> this is Gail from Swindon. Irrational fears. Yes, um, there's this the same um, program as it were that Marie was at. I was at the church at Reading where Yinka who does you know the healing, the turning, was doing two days teaching on deliverance and I had a, a, an issue which was that for many years I'd had very minor claustrophobia, minor so minor that actually it didn't really impinge much on my life and I wasn't bothered about it or concerned about it. But then suddenly in 2016, what was minor became a big thing. And I was aware of this sort of claustrophobia closing in on me, which wasn't too much of a problem except that for very, very important family reasons, I needed to go and visit my brother, who lives in Nairobi, Kenya, in October. Very important reasons. And I thought, I can't get on that plane. 
I've traveled between Heathrow and Africa more times than almost you've had hot dinners. <laughs> but I knew that now this was such an issue that I could not get on that plane. And I thought, help, 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 help. And I had visions of myself at 30,000 feet saying, excuse me, we have to land. I need to get off. And I'm not being very pleased about that. <laughs> Anyway, we went to Yinka's conference and of course every time he gave an appeal for deliverance or whatever, whatever, great crowds of people would flock up and go to the front and so you were left thinking, I'm, I'm never going to get any help here. So this went on and on and on and then suddenly there was one point the second day in the meeting, he'd ministered away and people had gone and got deliverance and whatnot. And then he came off the stage and he was sort of standing a few meters from me. And I turned around and there was nobody clamoring for his attention. And everybody always clamors for Yinka's attention. And I thought, this is my moment. Quick, seize it. So I rushed up to him and said, Yinka, please can I have some prayer? I, I've got claustrophobia and I have a flight coming up and I can't do it. So he talked to me about how God spoke to Abraham and brought him out and showed him the land and how he raises us up and he expands our boundaries and how the Satan shuts us down. So he said, right, I'm going to pray for you. So he put his hand on me and one of his assistants came and put his hand on me and they started to pray. And I went down blonk on the ground. And I don't know what they prayed to this day. I have no idea. But it departed. Or whatever it was... <laughs> I just felt it go, it just went. And then they prayed for me somewhere and I sat up and I knew, I knew with total certainty that it had gone, that terrible fear, that claustrophobia, it had gone. And so in October, got on the plane to Nairobi and all the way there, I kept walking up and down the aisles and round the backs with my hands in the air and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I saw my brother. I spent a lovely time with him and kissed him and hugged him and told him I loved him and came back and God did it. Very good. God did it. Very good. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> um, so there we are. Irrational fears or premonition of evil can also... Uh, They'll be part of the deal. Um, how do we test whether this is a demon or something else? Well, here we go. We start by asking, is this problem simply flesh? Uh, like, if you're feeling stuck spiritually, am I just being lazy? Uh, you know, should I be pressing into God through his word more or whatever? So we always ask the question, is this flesh? Is this laziness? Is this lack of discipline? Is this wrong thinking. If a problem cannot be disciplined, it may be a demon, is the sort of byword. Um, or we need to say, is this an issue of sin for which people need to take responsibility? So for instance, if people are being plagued by filthy language, are they watching the wrong sort of films which is feeding them that filthy language or, or, or on the wrong sort of uh, websites or whatever? So we we, we need to test, we need to exclude all other possibilities. Well, if we're still left with this, uh, let's deal with it. How about ministering deliverance? How do we do this? Well, first of all, I just want to suggest to you, if you think you're confronting a demonic problem, it's nothing you get worried about, but it is something you need to prepare for in terms of uh, times of prayer with people. Uh, first of all, even if this is a demonic problem, is there some sin that people need to take responsibility for and repent of? Have they got themselves into something that has opened them up to uh, demonic uh, interference? Secondly, does this person want to be free? Now that's a very important question because there are times when uh, we live with our enemies like friends. In other words, fear can be a very good excuse for not doing, you know, too much or making, you know, 
having too much adventure or going to many different places or whatever it may be. So does the person want to be free is a big question as well. And the third thing is, can this person we're going to pray with see that they have a demonic problem? And understanding, and sometimes there has to be some explanation of how demons work and how demons affect us, and that is, doesn't mean to say they're sort of Satan-possessed in some way, but, but do people understand that there is a demonic issue here and they need setting free? This is not just a matter of counselling uh, or a bit of advice here and there, but they do need setting free. It's a prayer, it's a moment of you know, confrontation spiritually in people's lives where people get set free. Okay, in terms of ministering deliverance, when we get to the actual ministry, uh, we, would, we would countenance that we always work in a team with other people. Um, that's just common sense. Two are better than one. Two can always see more. I remember a wonderful time when um, Jeff and Mary, uh, who were, Jeff and Mary and I were working together in the church in Oxford, so you can tell this is a few decades ago, uh, um, but uh, Jeff and Mary were called by a student house saying one of the girls in this house was in a, an absolute mess and, uh, you know, could we go and pray with her? And Jeff rang me up and said, uh, are you free? I think we need some, you know, spiritual clout here. So we all three went in together to this student household and sure enough, these well-meaning students had been praying with this dear girl hours and hours and hours I mean it was just you know and she was no better only worse I mean she was in a terrible state moaning groaning uh you know etc well Jeff and I were ready for battle we could see this was a big thing we were, uh, but suddenly Mary snuck past her and she called forth the spirit of God in this girl to rise up against the evil that she was experiencing and the attack that she was experiencing. Well, I've got to say, within minutes, this girl was free. Jeff and I stood back and watched this wonderful demonstration, which taught us both a lesson as well. Uh, but all I'm saying is Mary was following the Holy Spirit. We need to be in team. Was I ever grateful that we were in a team that day uh, and that we were working together? Um, it was a very special time and... Uh, and not least for that dear girl uh, who is in a mess. Work with others in a team, acknowledge what other people are receiving, and act on that. Help the person relax. You know, this is not a big deal. This is part of the ministry of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, and we don't need to get all wound up about it. Um, that we need to make sure there's repentance, confession, receiving of forgiveness and renunciation of whatever sin has been involved or the demonic hold that is there. And forgiveness of anyone involved in the problem needs to be given and declared. Now I'm saying quite a lot very shortly, but I'm trying to give us an overall feel of what we need to be doing. Just continuing on, team breaks the hold of the enemy, looses any spiritual holds, and commands demons to go. Do not discuss the matter with any demons who might try and talk to you. Uh, this happens quite often. Uh, you just do not enter into any conversation with anything demonic. You basically take authority and you command them to go. Do not get excited yourself. Do not start yelling or shouting. That's normally our own fear, and it doesn't give us any more authority. In the name of Jesus, we have all authority. And we can approach this calmly. Jeff, you were just going to share a story, I think, at this point of um, one situation you were in recently, which got a bit exciting. <laughs> Actually, another story came to mind which goes back a little bit further as well. <laughs> so this is going back to the early mid-70s when we first began to get involved in deliverance ministry. And uh, I remember this young lad, late teens, and I was praying with him with someone else for deliverance. I can't remember what the presenting issue was, but the more we prayed, the more he wriggled and writhed on the floor, and the more 
the louder we got. And it seemed it didn't matter what we prayed about, you got the same response. You could have paid, you know, a masala spirit or something and this got the same response. Uh, there is no masala spirit, by the way. Uh, and then after some time, uh, one of the other folks in the church came up and said to this lad, whose name happened to be David, he said, come on, David, pack it in. And with that, this guy got up and <laughs> sat in a chair. <laughs> and he was giving us a real old runaround. And I, I think part of it was he came from a Pentecostal background. I think a part of it was learned behavior. The other side of it, I think, and probably the stronger one, was attention-seeking. And it was just something uh, of the flesh. It was just him wanting attention. And there was no demon there. Uh, but he gave us the runaround for quite a while. So I think we need to move in a spirit of discernment, not just what spirit might be at work, but what s some of the responses are. So moving forward to last year, I mean, let, let me just preface this a bit because I just felt I should say this. When we got married in 1968, we felt at that time God stirring us up about the nation of Nepal. And uh, I paid a visit here in 76 on a ministry team and that was it. Nothing else happened. Thought oh, maybe we didn't hear God. And then at one of the more recent transforms, about 2013, I think it was, Joe and Chandra were sharing from the stage. Chandra prays in Nepali, and I burst into tears. And I thought, whatever is going on here? Come on, Norwich, you're English, you don't do that. Uh, but it was God bringing back to mind something he put in our hearts decades earlier. And the consequence of that is, cutting a long story short, the consequence of that is, for the last five years, we've been going out to Nepal for a month at a time, two weeks working in a theological college, lecturing, and two weeks working with Chandra and Joe. So last year, a year ago, March, we were in the ancient city of Bhaktapur, and we were doing two days of family life seminars in a, a, a church there. And afterwards, prayer was offered. And of course, everybody, all the world, and his wife and dog wants prayer. And there was, uh, towards the back of the church, there was a woman sitting on the floor there and about four or five Nepali ladies around her praying over her. And oh, she was making all sorts of fuss and show and noise and all the rest of it. Uh, and one of these ladies said, oh, this happens every week. <laughs> and of course, the more they prayed, the more fuss there was and the less was happening. And I thought, what do I do? I just sat down beside her and I just started praying. And so I was speaking to what, well, praying however I felt God telling me to pray. In English. Now, this is an interesting thing. They, she couldn't speak any English, this woman. And all but one of the ladies praying for her couldn't speak English, only Nepali. So I'm speaking in English. Now, you would think that wouldn't work. But I started praying. I just, just very calmly and quietly saying, in the name of Jesus, I just command you, be quiet. Leave her in peace. And that was about the level that I prayed. And after a while, she began to calm down and calm down and just settle down. And there she was in a state of peace again. But I felt as part of it was, it was an attention-seeking thing there, not of her own flesh, as it were, but an attention-seeking thing of the spirits that were at work within her. And she was giving, every week, this, these things were giving a number of ladies in the church a real runaround. So we need to move with a real sense of uh, discernment. Very good. Thank you very much, Jeff. Okay. Uh, manifestations, manifestations may occur, or they may not. And some people do go through some physical uh, feelings. You know, they feel that they expel something somehow. And sometimes people feel, you know, that's true of, you know, some sort of coughing or whatever or or hands shake or whatever you know trying to shake something off i mean there are all sorts of different manifestations um doesn't necessarily mean very much uh sometimes it does it's an indication that something's happening 
Um, but we can be deceived by those manifestations. The thing that we need to work on is what we sense the Holy Spirit is saying to us inside. As we minister, we're being di um, directed by him. We don't need to get excited about manifestations if they do come about. We need, we need to be a little bit careful, obviously, because... Uh, by the way, it's probably not wise to lay hands on people that you are praying for for deliverance. Uh, experience tells us that that can sometimes block the deliverance. Um, it's, I would, we encourage people not to pray in tongues when we're praying deliverance as well, because that can block the deliverance. But just to will God to break in and the uh, demonic influence to be broken. Um, just occasionally, if it's something like rejection, a touch can help. Um, but, uh, but by and large, we just need to be very, very sensitive. I remember years ago praying with somebody uh, for a, a spirit of anger. I mean, it was a very profound issue. Actually, uh, I was leading a conference in a church uh, with one of our brothers called David Freeman. And David, at the end of a session, had uh, a word of knowledge for, ab about somebody who had an anger problem that they could not uh, deal with. By the way, all the anger management courses, I think, they, they interest me in the sense that I think there are obviously ways that we can manage anger until it's a demonic issue when we can't manage it. Uh, and, you know, we need to understand that there are some things, again, beyond management. I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize a little bit uh, this afternoon. Uh, anyway, this was just before Sunday lunch, last session of this church weekend that we had been doing and everybody troops off for their Sunday lunch and David and I are praying with this brother for his spirit of anger. I mean he was very clear this was him because David described how it worked you know you've tried to control it you've tried to deal with it you set yourself certain patterns of behavior but you're still no better and and I mean he said it's ruining my marriage it's ruining my family uh, you know it's an absolute mess I need to get free from this thing. So uh, but here's a little clue. If you're dealing with someone with a spirit of anger, stand back. Uh, do not stand too close. Do not stand around them. You could get kicked, punched or anything very, very easily. So, I mean, you don't need to sort of, you know, go over the other side of the room and say, I'll pray for you. For you. But, but just watch what's going on. Keep your eyes open. When you're exercise, actually, when you're praying for deliverance, that's not a bad idea to keep your eyes open so that you can see what's happening and what God's doing, what the enemy may be doing as well, and give yourself some space. So I remember David and I, uh, you know, prayed with this guy for this spirit of anger. We needed to take all the space, uh, you know, but he got free. Here's the interesting thing, and I, I, listen, I still don't understand this to this day, but it was like God underlining to us that this was something real that was going on. This wasn't playing games. But as we prayed for him and suddenly he found a freedom and all of those manifestations and, you know, fist throwing and all the rest of it stopped and he came to his... In the dining hall where his 12-year-old son was sitting, he had a glass in his hand. At the very moment when we expelled this being, the glass broke into a thousand pieces. And it broke with such a loud explosion that the whole dining room went quiet. It was as if God wanted to say to us, you are not messing around. There are real things that happen here and we need to understand we're not playing games. It was also a step to us praying with that 12-year-old boy who'd lived with a father with anger issues for years and had been very damaged by it. And he also got healed that day of certain things. So, Ministering deliverance. Afterwards, pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Encourage them to live in the Scriptures. Encourage constant praise of God. Encourage them to put on the helmet of salvation. In other words, they think rightly. 
encourage them to live in right relationships, to stay close to others. Here's some don'ts. Don't let people put you under pressure to be prayed for. <laughs> I remember a few years ago, the leader of a conservative Anglican church in the city of Oxford ringing me late one Saturday evening. It was probably about 9.30, 9.45. And he says to me, he's got a slightly posh voice, he says, Stephen, he said, uh, I just need a little bit of input from you. Um, I've got a girl here who's really demonized. And, it's, and he described to me, it was clear she was demonized and all the rest of it. And he said, I, I knew you had a lot more experience of this than I have. Um, but what would, I, what would you encourage me to do? I said to him, well, David, if I were you, I wouldn't start now. Uh, this was quarter to ten in the evening. I said, she's had this demon for years. I said, bind it up, tell her to go away and to come back on Monday morning and get free. <laughs> oh, he said, oh, oh, that's very helpful. Down went the phone, that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> The funny thing is, the following morning, this girl was in our meeting in Oxford, and I just knew that this was the one that, you know, he'd been with the night before. And again, it was a little bit like Jeff says, sort of this sort of attention-seeking thing comes for once. But I, so I said to her, so were you with David so-and-so last night? Um, and she was shocked. Uh, and she said, yes. I said, and did he tell you to come back tomorrow? So she said, yes. So I said, well, why don't you go back to him tomorrow uh, and fulfill your obligation that you've, you've taken out with him? Now, people will push us around. Don't get pushed around. Uh, don't minister when you're tired or unprepared. Don't get into fear or worry. Minister with faith. And if you feel, I, I need a bit of help here, then call for help. Uh, you know, don't blunder on thinking, I don't really know what I'm doing. So, you know, somebody said to me one day, one of our younger leaders said, do you know what, I've never, you know, prayed for deliverance with someone. I said, is there someone you think needs deliverance? And they said, yes. I said, well, why don't you bring along? Let's do it together and we can show you how it's done. Uh, you know, but if you need to learn, get with someone who's going to do it and, or, you know, all I'm saying is we don't have to struggle on, on our own. Now it's five past three. Roger's got one or two little stories, one word of knowledge. Can I take a few questions first? Are there, are there three or four questions which we can run around with a mic with and then we'll try and deal with those and then we've got one or two little stories from Roger and a word of knowledge and then we might just pray if we need to. If there are no questions, we've answered them all, that's fine. On the back row there, we'll Alan. On the back. <laughs> we'll be sitting at the back here, yeah, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just a question, Steve, in terms of um, when you're praying uh, to release someone from oppression from a demon, do you have to name the demon or is it just you can just speak to the demon, demon without naming it? Um, I, th I think it is always better to be as clear as you can be. If you really suspect, you know, that it's a particular thing, then name it. And you get the person's agreement. Is this, is this the issue? Yes, I agree, this is the issue. Then let's name it. And there is more authority in naming it. However, there are times when, you know, you do name some things and you've got to think, I don't know if there's something else. You know, maybe you're praying for a, against a spirit of fear of open spaces. <laughs> Uh, well, let's pray against the spirit of fear of open spaces, claustrophobia, etc., etc. But any other spirit of fear that afflicts this person, because you, you suspect there's something more, I think that's uh, certainly permitted to go a bit more general then. But I think you have more authority if you're specific. Thanks. Over here. Uh, there's one instance where the disciples are trying to cast out a demon and then Jesus cast, cast it out, but he says, 
uh, some of these do not go without fasting and prayer. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, yes. Um, th there are times when you have a time of prayer with someone where you feel, I'm not sure that we got everything here. And I'm not sure this person is completely free. And I think, I think personally, the best thing is to be honest with people. And I think I've had times when I've had to say, look, I think we've got as far as we can get now, but I think there's something more that, you know, may be needed. Perhaps we need to pray a bit more, ask God to give you some revelation. Is there something more? Ask God to give us some revelation. Is there something more? And let's come back together in a couple of weeks and see if we feel there's some unfinished business here. The Holy Spirit is a revealer, and I think we have to, you know, call him into the action sometimes. We feel we're not seeing everything we need to see. When we're tired, we don't see everything we need to see. Uh, you know, when, when we've got another appointment, we don't see everything, you know, that we need to see. We get under pressure. There are times when actually we don't get the revelation that we need. We need to be honest about that, go back to prayer, get some more faith, maybe even read some more testimonies, hear some more testimonies, because sometimes it's to do with our own faith, and it's an issue of faith, obviously. Dave. I've actually got quite, quite a lot of questions on this whole subject, um, partly because I've seen quite a lot that's not been good yeah. in the past and like you say you know people are praying and there's usual stuff it's more like a show type thing but so we kind of back off on deliverance so there's a kind of thing like when, well we're happy to pray for people on a sunday morning but you're in a situation where you're in people and you're pretty sure that there are people that more needs to be done what's the next step because you know that it's not just a sort of, let's just pray for, because you're talking about managing an illness. You yep. know it's more than that. Uh, well, I, I would say very simply to them, and I have done many, many a time, say, look, I'm happy to pray for you now. Uh, you know, that God helps you with this thing. But I think there's more praying that we need to do once we've had time to talk properly, once we've had time to discuss this properly. I mean, and the, the difficult thing is, of course, there are times when God sovereignly moves and bang, it's done. There are other times when understanding helps, helping people to understand what the demonic is about helps, uh, you know, getting a little bit more information ourselves on what's really going on in them, that helps. So, you know, you do need to stand back, I think, at times and, and get more information, take more time and, and give it more time. Um, yeah, so I think quite often that's, especially if you think there's some deeper things going on, and a simple prayer is not going to fix this. Uh, we've got, we've got, Jeff, I think, wants to make a comment on that. Yeah. yeah. Picking up what our brother over here said, and uh, what Dave was just saying. Um, I remember, it's just the story has come back to mind, sorry. But I remember one case, occasion, I had a phone call, and this guy said, oh, he said, um, it was still okay to, to pray with my wife for deliverance tomorrow night? I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. He said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, as we agreed, you know, I'll be fasting. And, you know, something just alerts you. I said, and what about your wife? Oh, no, she finds she gets very hungry when she fasts. Uh, <laughs> I thought, I'm expected to fast. He's fasting. Who's got the problem? And, and I think it's something about this with, as Steve was saying, you know, we, we, it's a holding operation, we'll get together to pray later. But I think we need to encourage people to do their own preparation. And as much as us who are, we who are ministering might need to pray and fast, the person who wants the deliverance also, I think, could do with praying and fasting. And it might be by the time we get back together again, they've starved it out. Very good. There was one more question at the back. This will be the last one. Because I just don't want to go on too long. No, it's behind. It's not me. Yes, at the back. So, 
I wondered with satanic um, deliverance, if someone has been getting involved with witchcraft or things that are more on the satanic line, is that harder or more different? Should you prepare differently? Should you say things differently? Is there a chance of when it comes out, have you got to say where it's got to go or ha so it doesn't get into something else like the pigs did off the cliff? Do you see what I mean? I think yep. that's a fear that I would have is that, am I getting out? Am I going to get it away? Or is there something I need yep. to be aware of? No, look, um, it's a very good question. Um, and obviously there are satanic associations with certain root issues. So Freemasonry, for instance, I mean, that, you know, is one avenue for satanic holds and playing with Ouija boards, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, all of those things are entrances for satanic holds. Uh, in my view, those things do not need to take any longer than other things to deal with. If there is recognition that this was wrong and stupid, s sinful, <laughs> and, uh, and there's repentance, this person wants, uh, wants to turn away from this and be rid of all evil associations. It's more to do with the quality of repentance uh, and turning away from this thing, that's, that's where the freedom comes. And it doesn't actually depend on us who are ministering deliverance. It more depends on the posture of those who are involved. I mean, our faith is that we have authority. We do have authority. Uh, and so, we, actually, I'm not sure that this case is bigger than another. It might, might be more deep-rooted in their personality. But it's, it's no more difficult to deal with uh, I would, I'd, there is no authority in scripture for telling demons where they need to go just to get out of this person. You have legal authority to do that and if they have, le you know, they have basically rejected every involvement in that, that gives you all the legal authority that you need. Okay, Roger, over to you quickly, please. Is this on? Great. Okay. Um, this is a month old, so this is trying to be up to date as possible. Somebody came to us and asked and said, um, I have problems with confidence. Whenever I stand in front of people, I can't look at them and I can't uh, address a group of people. I have this insecurity and horrible feelings. Uh, can you please pray for me and help me? So Di and I, pairs of people, uh, went to, <laughs> to see him. Uh, prayed, it, prayed beforehand, just asked God to reveal things. And um, we've had a little bit of uh, sozo training, so there's some ways of helping people look to see where things have come from. We call it the four doors. So we asked him a simple question, uh, where did this first happen? And as he prayed about it, he had a, a picture of what happened to him as a young boy. His dad was in the Air Force, and when he behaved himself, he would have these wings which he could wear on his shoulder. So he went around very proud, very approved of, and then he would do something wrong, not do his homework or get something wrong or displease his dad, and his dad would rip the uh, wings off you, say, you're not having those until you're, you, you, you behave better again. So he would go around trying to behave, trying to do things to please his dad and go around. And it took, used to take ages. Then he'd get his wings back. So he'd go around all happy again and they'd be ripped off again. And so we asked, we, he, he knew that something went on as he did that. And basically, he, um, we asked, what lie came in as this happened? And it was the lie of this, that God did not approve of him. God, his heavenly father, disapproved of him when he got things wrong. And even though he asked for forgiveness, God would still disapprove of him. So we said, we said together, is this God's nature? And he said, no, this is a lie. So we said, okay, let's renounce this lie. So we renounced the lie, forgave his dad for doing this. And then we simply just prayed in Jesus' name, insecurity and rejection be gone in Jesus' name. And he said, now, Let's just ask God, what is the truth on this? And so he asked God, please, will you show me the truth? And he felt God saying, I am with you all the time. It's a good scripture, isn't it? And then the next bit, he just, we just wait a little bit more. And he said, 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he could stand in front of people and talk. And then he got another little thing, a little bit of just we got this together. And he said, I will mount up with wings like eagles. I will run and not be weary. And so we just prayed, asked God to fill him with the Holy Spirit. He has been different since then. In fact, the fruit of it is somebody he has been out of relationship, felt rejected by for something like seven years this last week. He's had the most wonderful conversation. They've got back together and they feel that their relationship is now fine. There's fruit coming out of a, a deliverance like that. Second deliverance did happen a little while ago. I was asked to see two people, a, a husband and wife, because the wife was feeling that her husband had fallen into a horrible depression. And what he basically did, he really got a lot of kick out of being able to tell people what they were thinking about. He worked in a, um, um, a store, a, a building store, and he would be able to know as people walked to him what they were about to order. And he would go, what you want is so many planks of this, a bag of this, and the person used to look and say, how do you know? I said, oh, I got special information. And he would meet with a group that would go and ask dead relatives for information. And he would be in this group, which of course is a fortune telling demonic thing. And so he came and he had fallen into a depression. So we, we sat there together and asked to see them. And he began to tell this wonderful ability he had and everything. And after a while, I thought, I've heard enough of this. I said, well, listen, the fruit of this is not good. It's not good for your family. It's not good for you. You're in depression. In fact, the Bible says that this is forbidden. And actually, you are going to end by bringing destruction to yourself, to your family, to everything around you. Do you want to continue this? Or would you like to know a Jesus who gives you life, who wants to speak to you in a new way? He said, well, now you're talking about that. I think that's what I want. So I said, okay, I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer. And it was because it was my office, I had a little um, Nicky Gumbel, Why Jesus book. And there's a lovely little prayer for committing your life to Jesus in there. This was my thinking. He needs Jesus to get those demons out of him. He needs to know Jesus first before those demons are going to go. So I said, now, um, you, you'll find this quite a little sort of uh, step. Uh, but we need to pray this prayer. So can you read this prayer here? And it starts off, Jesus... Um, uh, I think it goes, I thank you for going to the cross for me. So it says, can you say that prayer? And he goes, Jesus, I thank you. Oh, oh. I said, just keep praying. It's all right. Just keep <laughs> going. And, and he tries again. Oh. And by this time, his stomach is coming in. So just keep going. Say a prayer. It's a real simple prayer. This is what you want, isn't it? He says, yes, this is what I want. And eventually, as he... he, he he did actually writhe a lot, and his stomach was really hurting. But he got the prayer out, committed his life to Jesus. Then we said, witchcraft, all that you've been involved with, go in Jesus' name. And within the next week, he was in church. Within a month, we baptized him. He has gone through a rocky ride, I have to say, but he is still, his faith is in Jesus, and he loves Jesus. And there's things to work out in his, in, in his life. And his ability to fortune tell people has been lost Praise in God. the process. So I believe there's a guy out there who does wonderful deliverance, sets people free, and he wants to free people. I just felt there was one person in here today. You suffer from a lot of neck pain all around here. And I felt God saying, this happened, this has gone right back to your childhood. And it's associated with rejection as a childhood. And if that's you and you know it, and say, why not come and get a bit of prayer? Because I think God wants to set you free today. Very good. You can keep that. Um, okay, very good. Well, I think just need to wind up here. There's one word of knowledge. I did feel that there were people who would be in the seminar who just need to get rid of some rejection because it's a crippling thing for you. Uh, you can either do it this afternoon or you can go home and get it done at home. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there is freedom. There is freedom for every single one of us to thrive and flourish and live the abundant life of Christ. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. amen. Over to you.
Great, that was excellent, wasn't it? Thank you, Steve. Um, we're going to finish there, but for anybody who does want prayer, please would you come forward. And there are a number of you who have been asked if you could come forward and be ready to pray with people. So if you are one of those, or if you've got experience of praying with people, but no one's approached you, if you could also make yourself available, because we don't know how many people we'll be praying for, and it would be good to have a good number of us. So apart from that, please feel free to go and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So thank you all for coming.